All right, I hope you enjoyed that break. We got another, we have another great uh, speech, uh, another talk coming up right now. Um, this is Boima, he's a contributor on Handshake, which is a uh, decentralized peer-to-peer um, DNS name service. I hope I didn't mess that up, that's good. Okay. Um, yeah, he's, he's gonna give a great talk. Thank you, can you guys hear me okay? Everyone? Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. So, yeah, my, hello, MIT. I'm Boima. Uh, as Hugo said, I'm a contributor to Handshake. Um, I also work for a company called Purse, which is a Bitcoin e-commerce company. I work on the open source side. We uh, contribute to um, a Bitcoin implementation we have called Bcoin and then also to Handshake. And so, speaking of Handshake, I've been uh, contributing now for like almost the last year. Um, doing everything from rebuilding the marketing site to writing embedded software for the Ledger Nano S. So if you, you know, have ever written a lot of C or even worse, refactor someone's CSS, you, <laughs> you will know I'm happy to, you know, pull my head from under the ground and talk about the protocol today. So, Handshake, it's an experimental P2P root DNS. Um, what that means is basically we are a naming system that's compatible with DNS. Um, we've taken the root zone or essentially all top level domains on the internet. So think um, com or net or org as opposed to google.com or um, insert name.net. <laughs> I can't think of one right now. Um, and so uh, we've embedded that into our blockchain state and then open up the rest of that namespace for uh, auction. Um, the reason we've done that is we think that if you tie the ownership of a name to a UTXO, then you can create a chain of trust by using a digital signature. And that chain of trust can be anchored by the peers of the network instead of kind of the centralized way that that trust train, chain of trust is uh, anchored now. Um, it looks like maybe people are kind of thinking, what is he talking about? I know DNS is kind of like this like very uh, nebulous and somewhat esoteric topic for people that use the internet every day. So I'll try to break it down a little bit simpler for you guys. Um, and for those of you that understand DNS, bear with me. Um, so um, at a high level, we're naming on the blockchain. And there are projects that already do naming on the blockchain. So a lot of times when I you know talk to people about Handshake, people ask, well, why not? use Namecoin or Blockstack or ENS? And it's a valid question. Um, there are a couple differences that are pretty um, specific to why we decided to do our own chain and why these projects could be compatible with our chain, but you know, different. One thing is the point I brought up earlier, which is top level domains. All of these projects uh, tend to have their own TLD, so like with ENS it's, Dot eth and with Blockstack, you know, you can, it's like dot ID and I think you can like create other namespaces. And then with Namecoin, it's dot bit. But with Handshake, you're actually buying the TLD and you can administer your own subdomains off of that TLD. Um, we're also compatible with DNS. So to resolve names on the Handshake network, you would have to run your own uh, Handshake resolver or at the very least, you know, change your DNS settings in your OS. But once you change your DNS settings in the OS, you still get to browse the regular internet because we've already embedded those TLDs into our chain. You also just get access to any names that have been bought on Handshake and resolving to whatever servers that they uh, post in their name records. So really, Namecoin or Blockstack or ENS could be built on Handshake. Um, and actually, um, I'll get into how we kind of reserve names later, but we've actually reserved these TLDs that they use on our chain as well, so we hope that like we can uh, interoperate with them, or really not even interoperate. Just we do operate with them. We just hope that they kind of will play nice with us. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, okay, so here's a warning. I'm gonna give like a pretty basic uh, run through of how DNS works. By show of hands, who kind of understands how DNS works at a high level? Cool. Okay, so we'll make this pretty short. So. Um, at a high level, you can think about DNS as having kind of like two parties when a name is trying to be resolved. 
Um, there's like a recursive DNS name, uh, uh, a recursive resolver, which is actually like querying the name servers to get the information, which will ultimately be the IP that you're trying to get to. And then there are authoritative name servers. Now these authoritative name servers kind of know the whereabouts of certain servers on the net, but it's um, demarcated by these zones, right? And so if I'm authoritative over, let's say, um, the root zone, then I know where all of the servers that uh, point to like com or net or org are, but I may not necessarily know where google.com is. So um, I'll kind of walk you through the process, right? So like, let's say, you know, you want to go to google.com and really there's like, another resolver on your computer, but for the sake of this, we'll say that like, we'll start at the recursive resolver. And it's like, yo, where's google.com? And so it makes a request to a root name server, which is at the top here on the right-hand side, at, we'll say, 192.4104, which is actually, I did this this morning, this is actually the IP address. Um, and then that, one of those servers will go, well, I don't know where google.com is, but you can ask 192.5630 which is the com name server, and they may be able to help. So then the recursive resolver is like, yo, where's google.com? I'm still looking. And com's like, yo, uh, I don't know, but I do know who knows the zone, for, or who's governing the zone for google.com, so why don't you ask that uh, server? And now we finally get to the authoritative server for google.com, and this is a server that actually, when you ask, hey, where's google.com, it's like, hey, I know where google.com is, I'm authoritative over that zone. And so it gives you the IP address, or it gives the computer, your computer agent the IP address, and then that's how your computer or your client, basically your browser, knows where to pull the information for google.com. Um, so to reiterate, because like people kind of don't get this point, we are, as Handshake, all the nodes on the network are acting as this root name server, right? They're, they're essentially like serving uh, uh, the records for this root zone. So you might ask, well, why are you doing this? Um, and it's to solve Zuko's triangle. So Zuko's triangle, I'm sure you all know, it's this classic trilemma um, or a problem in which there are three choices and you can only pick two, right? And so Zuko's triangle essentially states that in a network protocol, where names or identifier need to be administrated, you can only pick decentralized, a decentralized network, uh, security, or human meaningfulness, right? So decentralized basically is about uh, the system working over trust boundaries, so peers can connect without being vulnerable to each other or third party. Um, security is about name resolution, right? Basically, um, the names resolve to the correct servers on the network. And human meaningfulness is about people. That means, you know, I can go to google.com, I don't have to go to 172. whatever the IP address was. Um, and so, in the regular DNS system, the system really kind of chooses security and human meaningfulness, right? Because, as we saw, google.com is a name that you can remember, right? That's totally human meaningful. Um, and you can, assuming you trust a CA, which I'll get into later, or a certificate authority, you can get to the right IP address of the server that you want, right, on the network. But that decentralization piece is where we're trying to uh, make some improvements. Um, so right now, the internet infrastructure is basically, it relies on this idea of a trusted certificate authority, right? And a certificate authority is essentially um, an organization that can attest that a name actually resolves to a particular server, right? You see it as the green check mark or whatever you know, your browser uses as a, a TLS OK connection has been created um, in your browser. But there are problems to this trusted certificate authority situation, right? CAs can get hacked. And if a CA gets hacked and someone can just issue you know, certificates ad nauseum, then like, people can get just spoofed on the internet. You might go to a website that says that it's google.com, but it's not really google.com, but your computer gets confused because this attacker has a valid certificate from a CA. So we think that this is a process that could be disintermediated and would be better for like, internet safety. Um, anybody who's kind of like, hip to like, internet culture knows that, like, I don't know, Devs kind of hate CAs. Um, hope there aren't any representatives of CAs in here, because I don't retract the statement, but it sucks to hear that. <laughs> um, 
And the cool thing about Handshake is that because it's a DNS project, there's already protocols um, spec that we could use to kind of side pass CAs, right? There's this uh, idea of a TLSA record. So basically, at a high level, what this means is instead of having to go to a CA and authenticating with them and then getting your certificate, the, the, the zone operator can actually um, attest to the server details and that connection can be made from the server using DNS. Um, that requires clients changing, so it requires uh, browsers accepting this uh, standard, but this is a process that's been going on for a while and people have been petitioning to uh, kind of get the ball rolling and uh, force the browser's hands. And this is also something that like, is not Handshake specific, right? Like TLSA can be used for a lot of different things and you know, we hope that there's adoption there. Um, so talking about names, how do you get these names? So um, name registration is handled by uh, what are called Vickery auctions, which are essentially um, sealed bid uh, second price auctions. So basically, um, you go through an auction process, and then whoever the winner is actually pays the second price, which kind of models like what you would see in like um, you know your typical auction that with the with the auctioneer and the loud talking, right? Because he said like he or she says, you know who bids you know one dollar, and then everybody says they bid one dollar, and they says who bids two dollars, and then everybody says who bid two dollars, and then they you know they say who's bidding three dollars, right? And no one bids the three dollars. So the person actually gets the second price, kind of, right? It kind of models that behavior a bit. Um, and we facilitate this through uh, a native coin on chain. So Handshake is its own blockchain. It's a fork of Bitcoin. Um, and I mean, it basically works the same way Bitcoin works. We've changed the, uh, the proof of work algorithm, or, or not even the algorithm, just the hash function. We're using Hashcash, but we're using like a SHA-3, like a funky SHA-3 with Blake 2B construction. Um, don't worry about what that means. Basically, it's so, um, we want to be ASIC friendly, but we don't want ASIC, oops. Excuse me. We want to be ASIC friendly, but we don't want uh, ASICs to already exist on the market, right? We want to kind of have like, you know, everyone have a fair chance to get into the mining game. Um, and we also have changed uh, the output structure for UTXOs. So typically on a Bitcoin UTXO, you could think of it as having a value and then a script, right? Some sort of like authorization script that like says you can spend these coins. We've also added uh, a covenant type and field, right? And so this covenant you can think of is just like a restriction on how you can spend the output. Um, now we've added 12 covenant types and with these covenant types we can kind of model an on-chain auction without having to do, you know, stateful contracts. Um, and then we've also added a new op code uh, called uh, OP type, and that's just an introspection on these, uh, on these uh, covenant types. So you can do some cool scripting with that. Um, that's basically it on how we're different from Bitcoin. I guess we also, because we're starting now, uh, everything's segwit by default. So it's like BEC32 addresses by default. There's no difference between uh, pay to script hash and pay to witness script hash. It's all, it's all segwit by default. Um, but it's pretty similar to Bitcoin. Um, so thinking about how these auctions work, um, basically someone can submit an open transaction, which is basically taking some coins that aren't encumbered by any uh, uh, covenants, and then spinning them into an output that has an open type. And then from there, there's a round of bidding. And these bids are a similar construction. You take some coins, you lock it up in a bid, uh, in a bid covenant. Um, from there, there's a round of bidding, then there's a round of revealing your bids. So these bids are you know, sealed bids, so you can mask the bid. If you wanna, let's say you wanna bid five uh, um, HNS, right? Um, HNS is the, the name of the coin. You can actually lock up 10 HNS so people don't actually know what you're bidding, right, in the bid phase. And then in the reveal phase, you reveal that you actually bid five, and then you get those five coins back, right? So as a way to kind of like help with price discovery. Um, and then after this reveal, there are two forks you can take or two paths in the road. If you didn't win the auction, then you can redeem. And basically what that redeem does is it takes this uh, kind of covenant trail that's been restricting how you can spend these coins and it frees them up so you can like use them for, you know, buying whatever you want to buy with h and um, And then uh, if you win, then you can register. And then this registering is what actually like gives you control of the name and allows you to update the name records which are stored in this uh, covenant field. 
Um, and so with name management, we have a couple more covenants. So there's update, which allows you to update the name record so you can like put up any, I mean, we support all DNS records. So any DNS record that you'd wanna add to a domain, you can add to a handshake domain. Um, you can uh, renew, so there's a, uh, these names expire but you can renew names. Now with renewals, we have you commit to uh, a, a recent block hash, so you can't just like pre-sign a bunch of transactions and like you know keep a name forever. Um, and then you can also transfer names to different people if you don't necessarily want your name anymore or let's say you get a name and it becomes pretty valuable for whatever reason or someone wants to buy it and they offer you, give you an offer you can't refuse, then uh, you can transfer the name as well. And then you can actually also revoke the name, which is basically burning the name from the system. Um, now, all this name data is actually stored in a different data structure called the Urkel tree. Um, you can think of the Urkel tree as simply a base to a uh, Merkleized try. Um, so um, the one difference is that a lot of Merkleized try implementations, or just try implementations in general, uh, store all the data in an underlying key value database. We're going straight uh, to flat files on disk. Uh, that helps with performance. Um, Using this construction and committing to it in the block hash also allows us to do SPV like Bitcoin, but it's cool because now you can do SPV name resolution, so people don't actually have to run full nodes to resolve names. If you want to run an SPV client, you can. Our SPV client is pretty slick. I think it requires like, I don't know, 10 or 12 megabytes of memory. It's really lightweight. Um, I was gonna go through the benchmarks, but I'll kind of skip that for now, but it's, it's, it's a pretty good big advancement over the, we, we originally wanted to use the Ethereum uh, Merkle Patricia try, but uh, it was pretty slow and it didn't really do well on SSDs. Um, they store a lot of, I won't get into the, the details. If you want to, you can talk to me after that. But th there are some uh, optimizations that we made. Um, uh, we actually, so we have two variants of this tree. Um, there's a one that, does some optimizations on storing internal nodes and one that doesn't. There are trade-offs to this. Um, again, I can get into that offline. Uh, I kind of want to get to questions if you guys have any. Um, so one of the big FAQs we get um, is, what about squatting, right? Like, why can't I just like hop on and buy Google.com? Um, so we thought about this, and in, ex in, in addition to basically reserving all of the current like 1,500 or so TLDs, we've also taken the Alexa top 100,000 or more so like 80,000 and we reserve those domains as TLDs. So you, well, Google's not, not, not a good example because Google's actually a TLD, but like let's say Nike for instance, you can't come on the Handshake Network and buy .Nike, right? We've reserved it for Nike. Um, and they can actually uh, claim these names using DNSSEC proofs. Um, I was gonna go through a basic example of DNSSEC, but I kinda wanna skip through it to get to questions if people have questions. But basically, DNSSEC is like a, a security layer on top of DNS. Right now, when you query DNS names, um, there's no assurance that like someone didn't man in the middle of you and like change the records. DNSSEC uh, creates like a PKI over the different zones and allows um, like a parent zone or like a TLD operator to attest to um, the records of the subdomains underneath it. Um, I could go deeper into that. Maybe if somebody wants to ask a question for me to go deeper into that, ask that question. Um, or I can talk to you offline. Um, uh, and then yeah, and then so we also uh, are doing an on-chain airdrop. So we actually did um, a word people hate in this community and like I'm a Bitcoiner too, so uh, a pre-mine. But uh, we didn't do the typical do a big pre-mine and keep, you know, double digit percentage of the coins. What we did was, we did a pre-mine, um, we kept seven and a half percent, or not even kept, because there's no like handshake foundation, but we used seven and a half percent to pay for early contributors. Um, we sold another seven and a half percent to uh, investors to give uh, the coin like some sort of evaluation. And then 70% of, of the coins were given in the open source community. So um, the 10 million we raised from the investors, we gave them all away to uh, open source projects, research labs. Um, like literally we didn't keep any of that fiat. Um, and then we also are giving those projects 5% of the total coin allotment. And then 65% of the coins were doing a massive on-chain airdrop. So um, GitHub users, PGP Web of Trust members, um, Hacker News plus Keybase, uh, excuse me, sorry, uh, participants. Um, we've essentially created a third 
uh, Merkle tree, which is going to be in existence, I think the, the period to claim your airdrop is like the first two years or four years, I can't remember what the exact date is, but you can essentially use whatever key you use in the PGP Web of Trust or any of your GitHub SSH keys um, to basically make a claim and then you get like, I think at last count it was like, uh, I don't know, like 400 bucks worth of coins or something like this, um, valued at whatever it was. But the cool thing about the airdrop is, um, it's privacy enhanced. So what we did was we actually took, um, we created a, like a, a random scalar for each, uh, set, each key in the, in the tree, right? Or each leaf in the, key, in the tree, which uh, represents some key that you can uh, authenticate your signature with. And then you can take that key and combine it with, or that scalar and combine it with whatever key you have, and then create a signature on that commitment. So you're not actually creating a signature from your public key, you're creating a signature to a commitment to your public key, which means when you actually redeem these coins, you're doing it anonymously, right? Like someone can look and like, so obviously we posted how people get the coins, so there is like a set of all people who could possibly get coins that someone could like go through and like know that you may have gotten coins. But like once you claim, you're not actually giving up any uh, of your identity. Um, and then yeah, so uh, the software stack right now, we have uh, a full node um, called HSD. It's written in JavaScript. Uh, it's a root name server. Um, you can also use it as a recursive uh, server, but the idea is that like all peers on the network are uh, root zone uh, participants. And then we also have HNSD, which is the light client I was talking about earlier. It's also a recursive resolver, and that's what we would expect people to run on their machines or potentially just changing your DNS settings and pointing to one of our like nodes. Um, we're in testnet now. Um, don't ask about mainnet. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, and if you want to know any more information, uh, you can go to handshake.org. There's a paper there. Um, it's uh, It's pretty long and in ASCII, but I think uh, some guys at, the guys at Namebase, which is a registrar on our network, um, wrote like a really nice like explainer, so that's pretty good. Um, and we're at github.com slash handshake.org dash org, and then we have a discourse at handshake.community. Um, yeah, thanks. Roma, and uh, we have time for a few questions. So if anyone, you know, has any. Hey there. Um, hey. So I've been curious for a while about like how the actual architecture of this would work. Um, and it sounds like one, like most secure is to run my own full node yeah. and point my DNS on my operating system to that full node's IP yeah. address, yeah. right? And then second would be to run the light client, which is like kind of like ele Electrum, like pings a random full node and does the handshake there. Yep, yep. Huh. Not pun, not intended about yeah. handshake. Yeah, I mean, that's why the name is yeah. handshake. Okay, so, yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, so then I guess the other, the real question then would be like, how do you view the coin as as kind of capturing value to help secure the network, right? Oh, great question. So I left that part out. Um, so yeah, uh, the coin, so obviously the coin is used to pay miners and uh, you know, but also whenever you lock up value by winning an auction, that value is essentially burned. So the more people use the network, the more coins are burned actually, yeah. So we hope that like it's like a deflationary kind of effect on the coin value. Any other questions? Looks like we got one over here. Thanks. Um, sorry, this might be a bit too in the weeds or semantic, but um, on the auction mechanism, you mentioned it's a Vickery auction. Yeah. Um, I can imagine a case where someone might want more than one of these domains. Yeah. And Vickery is not, if it's a Vickery auction, not a VCG auction, it's not necessarily incentive compatible in the combinatorial case. You mean to have, to be able to participate in multiple auctions? I don't, I'm not if quite sure. If you're bidding for multiple question. items, you may not bid truthfully under oh. a Vickery auction. Right, 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 right. So yeah, we tried to mitigate this a little bit in the staggered way in which we released the names. Um, but you're right, like within, okay, so the way we release the names is that essentially um, you take the name, you hash it, um, and then you get like a, 
uh, essentially a hash is a random number, and then you take that random number modulo 52, and that is the week in which, in, in the first year in which the name is available, right? So names are kind of like randomly available per week, some, you know, some set of names, so that we, we would, thought that would help a little bit with like kind of like pushing out the, the time in which you can bid on different right. names, so but like each, you're right a bit. name comes up for auction at a certain point in time, so it is a single item auction yeah. at that point. Okay, yeah, Got but it. that said, like, you know, maybe two names that you want come out in the same week, right? And then like, that said, like, you can kind of dictate this, right? So like if there are names that you want that you think other people may not want, you can open bids on these names, right? The auctions don't start until someone initiates it. So potentially you can stagger how you open these auctions, but you know, you might miss some. So you're right, but you know, we've tried to mitigate that. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Great question. All right, anyone else? Um, could you please uh, comment on the performance compared to DNSSEC? Is it uh, is the resolution going to be faster or uh, are the pack is the pa are the packet size they would be less compared to DNS sec? Yeah. So in terms of performance, like that was partially the reason that we wanted to kind of optimize the tree. We didn't want to lose any performance uh, based on that, and it's pretty compatible with DNS. I mean, we got the proof times down a lot in terms of generating the proofs, which was good. Um, Proof verification is pretty simple. It's just like a Merkle branch proof. So it has, holds up pretty well. One advancement we have over DNSSEC in terms of security, I know you asked about performance, but to answer your question about performance, we don't get a crazy performance hit from doing this because it's all the same verification stuff. Um, one thing that we do that's different is, uh, so I guess maybe I'll go back to talk about DNSSEC a little bit. Uh, the way it works is there's like two kind of uh, keys that you have within a zone. You have a zone signing key, which is essentially um, used to, uh, what you do is you aggregate all the types of records within a zone. So all your A records, all your MX records, all your you know, uh, uh, NS records that you may have. You bundle them and then you sign using the zone signing key, right? Um, and then you take the key signing key and that's used to actually sign a record for the zone signing key, right? And so when you query uh, records on with uh, DNSSEC, what happens is you query the record and you query, um, uh, excuse me, uh, the signature that was created, right? And then you can use the stored key in the, do in the zone to uh, authenticate yourself, right? So DNSSEC actually only, um, signs individual records, whereas like with our DNSSEC kind of like variant, we sign the entire uh, uh, zone itself. So, or excuse me, we sign the entire, uh, yeah, well, not the zone, but the set of records in the zone, as opposed to like individual record sets. We sign the individual record sets too, but you can like pull down the entire zone data. Um, question? Bitcoin blockchain doesn't. Uh, do you imagine uh, advanced, like, or more advanced smart contract, smart contracting uh, capabilities? Uh, yeah. So um, you can do that for sure. So the the auctions, the the covenant system right now um, can be upgraded through Softworks. Shout out to Segwit. Um, and so. Uh, that is true that you can do that. That said, we really added it to serve the function of just the auctions. And so like, it would take a community effort to like, essentially get people to soft fork in whatever covenant system that you wanted for whatever application you wanted. Um, that said, um, the, the, the protocol actually has no um, conception of subdomains in that it doesn't want to govern subdomains. So you can imagine a TLD owner running their own sidechain or their own you know, blockchain system as a subdomain to issue names. And on that, you could like add in whatever soft forked uh, function, uh, smart, con smart contract functionality you wanted. Yeah. But the idea was like, you know, we needed one. It was kind of like the, I don't want to say that, the, I, I don't, I want to say the anti Ethereum way, but not in like a uh, aggressive or like uh, way. Just that like Ethereum was kind of like, you know, we want to make it to where you can do any type of application on this network, right? And we're kind of taking the, well, no, we actually just want to do name auctions because this is a naming blockchain, so we'll facilitate that and make it flexible for other things, but prioritize on the auctions. All right, awesome. I think uh, time's up for questions. Can we have another round of applause for Bowen, please? Thank you, guys.